Okay, so we are already building up quite uh, a nice um, ranking here. It's interesting, we don't have anyone in D yet. Now, I'm just looking through the people here. Well, we'll find out. I'm Part of me, I think we might not end up with anyone in D, which just means that that is a superfluous tier. We didn't need D if we don't end up with anyone in D. Um, but um, anyway, we'll see. Um, I just... Yeah, well, to, to be fair, by definition, the people I picked, who did I pick to be on this list? I picked, um, you know, the major kind of people in Jewish history. You know, this is a very biased list. I picked the people who are the greatest names. So I guess just by by virtue of, of making it into this uh, ranking at all, you know, these people have some either very influential or great people. So I guess it's almost by definition precluding kind of the very bottom. Um, either way, um, let's carry on. Okay. Next up, we have Rav Shamshan Raful Heish, um, the German rabbi of the 19th century, Frankfurt rabbi. Now, I have a very close spot in my heart for, for, in my heart for Rabbi Hirsch for several reasons. Firstly, family history, very, very close to my family history. The Posen family is from Frankfurt. Not only are they from Frankfurt, they are amongst 11 families that brought Rabbi Hirsch to Frankfurt. So this wasn't the time when... Uh, the mainstream Frankfurt community was drifting towards reform and the group of kind of more zealous, more what you may call proto-Haredi kind of, um, you know, most strictly orthodox families uh, weren't happy with that. And they brought Rabbi Hirsch to make a new community. I don't remember the, the name of the community, but it was the new, it separated from the mainstream community to create a new kind of more zealous, more strict community. And the Posen family were amongst 11 families who signed uh, uh, on that, I guess, request to bring him over. And the Posen family was very influential in this Rabbi and Rav Hirsch's community in Frankfurt. Some of our family members, some of my ancestors were Dayonim and Rabonim in his Bezdin, in his community, um, and otherwise influential people in that, in that community. Uh, so that's one reason why he is quite close to my heart. A second reason is because his writings were quite influential on me um, in my late teens, when I was going through a bit of a religious crisis, well, or, or, my whole teens is just one big religious crisis, um, that story is for another time, but um, I was being very disillusioned with, with Hasidism. As I said earlier, I didn't find Hasidic thought offered me much, um, especially not the Hasidic thought I was brought up with. I, in fact, I didn't find it having any thought. It didn't have any kind of philosophy, any systematic way of thinking. And when I was approaching, I would say this was the age of, when I was 17, 16, 17, um, I kind of, you know, I found myself yearning for some better understanding of Judaism that, you know, would give me some kind of philosophy, some kind of understanding why we do what we do, you know, the meaning of it all. And Rabbi Hirsch's 19 letters, so this is his book called 90 Letters, written in German, um, was, I found that a respite, I found that delicious, you know, it was just... It was for a little, it didn't, it didn't kind of save me for long because it didn't kind of deep down solve my issues. But um, for a while, I found that incredibly, wow, okay, somebody is addressing my questions. Somebody is asking, what does it all mean? Somebody is at least attempting to give meaning uh, to what this is all about. And I found him, you know, he's obviously a very brilliant man, very educated man as well. He went to university um, and he speaks the language um, of, you know, of somebody who is asking questions. Um, and I found his 19 letters incredibly, uh, uh, um, yeah, respite. Um, uh, um, and also his book, Chorev. So Chorev is almost like, um, you know, going through all the commandments um, and giving reasons to them. Now, he's interesting in his thought, he's interesting, he's not a rationalist like Rambam, he's actually quite critical of Rambam, we'll come to Rambam in a moment, he's quite critical of Rambam, because he thinks that Rambam is too Greek, too much of a Greek philosopher, too much, too rationalist, um, you know, he's not thinking like a Jew, he's thinking like a, like a Greek. Um, so he's not in that school of rationality, but he is incredibly rational, you know, his, his kind of, he, I don't, you know what, I'm quite confused, because whilst he attacks the Rambam, on being Greek, I find him to be quite German, or, or Hirsch. You know, he's also thinking, you know, outside of the traditional Jewish way of thinking. He's trying to find kind of humanistic, almost, explanations for, for the mitzvahs. Um, so I'm not sure how consistent he is there. Um, but anyway, he tries to find uh, 
explanations for the commandments that that makes sense on a more rational level, um, even though he would reject this term as a rationalist. But I find him, I found him quite interesting. Uh, so I would put him, uh, mm, it's interesting, very influential person. Um, um, where would I put him? Would he, does he deserve to go on A tier or should I, should I put him in B tier? I, I can't, I, I think, as I said, this is very subjective. I think for me, um, I think for me he would go on A tier, although on kind of an, if I was being a bit more objective, I don't think he's quite up there. I think, um, He'd have to be a bit more probably in the B tier. But um, for me, this is very subjective. For me, he belongs in the A tier. Next up, we have uh, the Ibn Ezra. Um, some people might know him as the Ibn Ezra, but we know him as the Ibn Ezra. We don't know much about him as a person, I don't think. Um, um, I don't know much about him. Incredibly opaque writer. Terrible, terrible writer. He almost, he basically, um, I think... Maybe some of why he's such a bad writer is because he's thinking in Arabic but writing it in Hebrew characters. So his grammar is Arabic, but he's writing Hebrew. Um, so it makes it almost unreadable. Um, also incredibly short writer. He has this way of just writing concepts in just a few, almost like in code. Um, he's seen as this, I don't know, is he a rationalist? He's, you know, he's seen as a philosopher. I don't think he's on the level of Rambam. Um, not as, um, but um, he is kind of an independent thinker. He has his way, you know, and some have said he has heretical thoughts as well. You know, when he questions uh, the mosaic authorship of the Torah, you know, sometimes he'll say something like, oh, this this verse couldn't have been written by Moshe, but I can't say more, basically, because it's heresy. He's also, um, you know, he took up the fight, to get, the fight against the Karaites. He has these polemics against uh, various people that he regards as Karaites. Quite a vengeful, angry writer. You know, he writes quite, he's quite nasty towards his enemies, uh, towards his intellectual enemies, you know, to ad hominem attacks, takes it quite personally. Um, I think he goes in B tier. I would put him in B tier. Um, yeah. All right, next up, this is the Ktos Hachoshan. And this video is getting quite long at this point, so I'm, I might just be a bit briefer here. Um, I didn't realize how long this was going to get, but, um, you know. It's quite quite a lot of fun. Um, the Ktos, okay. Uh, I want to say 18th century, might be early 19th. I'm not exactly sure. Um, brilliant, brilliant commentator on um, on. Well, he comments on the Shulchan Aruch on Chosha Mishpat and on the Avon Hueza um, in a different book, not called the Ktos. The name escapes me at the moment. Maybe it'll come to me. What's his book on Avon Hueza called? I don't know. I I, I don't remember. Um, and he also has a book called Shev Shmatza, which he wrote at a very, very young age. Um, now, even though he comments on the Shulchan Aruch, he's not a halachic writer, primarily. I mean, obviously, he, he arrives at halachic conclusions as well, but his his engagement with the Shulchan Aruch is very Talmudic, very analytic. Um, and it's interesting, going back to comparisons with the analytic philosophy, you know, just like, you know, David Hume, uh, 18th century philosopher, so way before analytic philosophy was a thing, is seen as in some way a precursor or father of analytic philosophy. And I think in a similar way, the Ktos, even though he's way before, uh, way earlier than the brisker analytic movement, I think he can be seen as a precursor to that analytic school of thought uh, because he's very analytic, um, very sharp. Uh, no, he, he eschews pilpil. He's not into making nice, uh, you know, connecting nice why things. He's about analyzing um about resolving problems, uh, um, um, conceptual problems. Um, very influential in any kind of Talmudic analysis um, in the yeshivish tradition. Um, brilliant writer. Um, I think that puts him... I think that puts him in the A tier. Yeah, I think that puts him in A tier. All right, uh, I'll pause here.